Now, you said this morning that there's no people anywhere else but on earth. What verses that say that in the Bible? How many of you wondered that? Nobody? Okay. Well, it's, it's a, that is a very good question. Um, if someone asks you to prove from the Bible, now this is not a rhetorical question. This is a direct, flat-out you know, question to you. If someone asks you to prove from the Bible how you know that there is not life on other planets like human life, how many of you would know where to turn in the Bible? Hold your hand up high. Okay, good. There's a brave soul. Good. I see. Okay, three of you so far. I'm going to call you up in just a minute. <laughs> um, think about that. We are in an, a naturalistic, evolutionary world. And it's simple for them to say, life evolved everywhere. I mean, you know, at different speeds, uh, different blobs. I mean, I just watched the National Geographic uh, film on the creation of the universe, which they called, you know, the Big Bang. It was fascinating. Someone spent a lot of money on that. And they actually went from nothing to an explosion, to the hot, to the spin, to the, the spin-off of spins, and all of a sudden it was raining. And, you know, I mean, it was just the most amazing movie I've ever seen. But where would you go in the uh, Bible? So I would like you to uh, think with me about what most people never think about. I mean, when people talk about, you know, Star Wars and, you know, all the civilizations and aliens and ETs and everything, they're not thinking biblically because, uh, and, and these are the verses that, uh, that immediately come to my mind. Uh, Genesis and just rehearsing the, the creation account, the restatement of the creation account um, in many places. Um, then, the very fascinating description that Second Peter gives us, and finally, looking at heaven and who is there. And those would be the streams of thought that I would have. So let's just look there. Let's, let's look for aliens real quickly in uh, Genesis 1. And, and what you have to test yourself about tonight is, do you just believe what it says? Or do you want to fall prey to saying, well, it says that, but it doesn't mean that. Because as soon as you take what God's word says and say, that is what it clearly says, but it couldn't mean that. Now, if there's a compelling reason, like in this question, um, you know, when it says, um, you know, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but then in the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. You would, never, you would never take a clear scripture, which is in James 1, that God cannot be tempted with evil, if I don't trip up here, and he doesn't tempt anyone. That is clear as day. I mean, it's just black and white. So whenever you have a clear teaching of the Word of God, you always will interpret something you're not sure about. So that is a, a principle of interpretation, but when you have something clear and it's repeated and repeated and repeated, you can't say it has to mean something else. So in, in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And heavens, it defines heavens. It says that's where the sun and the moon and the stars are. So it's not talking about the sky on a single planet of many. It's talking about a specific place where there's one planet with one life that's described and then the heavens. And, and it goes through that. And by the way, in the elder prayer this morning, I thought something very interesting. You notice in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, one of the elders was praying and saying, Lord, thank you that on this day you separated the light from the darkness. And, and remember, in God's way of looking at things, the first day of the week is what day? Sunday. That's today. 
this is creation week. This is, this is the beginning of everything we know about life and the calendar and time and everything else. This is the first day. This is Sunday was the first day of creation. And that in the evening and morning were the first day. And then there's the second day of the week. And God rested on the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, which is where the Sabbath comes from. So it's just fascinating. But that's the Genesis account. Now look how Paul restates it. So uh, what Genesis says is that God made the heavens, and he defines the heavens as where the stars and the sun and the moon are, and he made the earth. So he made this, everything, what we would call the cosmos, the, the, the solar furnaces, the myriads of galaxies and all that, almost, I mean, if you read Genesis 1, it's amazing. It says he made the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night, and he made the stars also made the stars also. He gives four words to something that numbers in the octillions at the least. I mean, a number beyond what we can understand of, of stars and galaxies of stars. And he only devotes four words to that. Now, is God saying something there? He talks about every inch of this place. The dirt, the water, the, the sky for birds to fly through. And the, in Job, he talks about how he laid the foundations and how he put together all the layers of the earth and how it's balanced and everything else. God really makes a differentiation. He minimalizes this is the, the minimum, you could say, four words. And he makes a maximum emphasis on the earth. So that's the Genesis account. Now look at Colossians real quickly. Um, and, and when you're processing this, one of the fun things to do when you're, when you're trying to biblically answer something is you look at everything the Bible says about it and you classify it and find the key points that the Lord makes. And this is, this is one of the key ones. Starting in Colossians 1, and, and this I mentioned this morning, this is from the fundamentals, one of the key verses about creationism. But it says, uh, Jesus, that's in verse 15. Be, how do we know it's Jesus? Because if you, if you back up, it's the one that redeemed us by his blood in verse 14. Uh, and uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. It's Christ who, who so we know it's Christ from 14. And then it says in verse 15, he, the, the Christ, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now pause for just a minute. The only God you'll ever see is Jesus. Have you thought about that? The only God you'll ever see. There's one God in three persons. The one you see that's invisible, physical, corporeal form, a body. God doesn't have a body. God the Father doesn't have a body. He's an infinite spirit. The Holy Spirit is an infinite spirit. Jesus Christ is an infinite spirit that became incarnated, has a body. So just process that. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And Hebrews 11 tells us that, that he is the exact representation of God. And John 1 tells us that too. And so Jesus is, if you want to see God the Father, Jesus said, look at me. And just take him at his word because that's who we see. And he's the image of the invisible God. So God is invisible and if you see God, it's Jesus. He is the firstborn over all creation. And, and that's fascinating. Or uh, just as a side view, when Paul talks about Christ being the head, and when he talks about him being the, the prototokos and all that, we do mathematics different than the, the Greeks. We do mathematics where you do a number, a number, a number, you draw a line, and this is the sum. I'm not doing tic-tac-toe here, by the way. If we're adding together, we put the sum where? At the bottom. But yet, when we go to the summit of a mountain, is that at the bottom? 
Isn't that interesting? That that is, that is a misnomer. Some in Greek mathematics, they would have their list of things that were being added together and they put the sum at the top. So when it says that Jesus is the prototokos, he is the sum, the total, the head, the height, the highest of all the creation that he made and he stands over it all as the firstborn. He is the one that God placed as he became incarnate as the son of God as the head over all creation. It doesn't mean he was the first created being, that's Jehovah's Witnessism and it's false. It's heretical. But he stands as the sum. Jesus is the sum of all that is. He, he well look, what it, he defines it right here. Uh, by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Now, did you notice what we're kind of sinking with here? Jesus, so, so God, Genesis says God created, but Paul clarifies God who? God the Son is the creator. So Jesus Christ is the creator. And he created the heavens and the earth. And, and notice, so it's sinking that we're talking about the same event. Uh, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Now, the more astrophysics goes, we have found out that more of the universe is invisible than is visible. That's what they call the black matter and black energy and black holes and all this stuff. Most of the mass of the universe, you know, they've calculated the mass of the universe. It's 10 to the 36th power or something, I don't know, some astronomical, unbelievable number. But the majority of it is invisible. And look who knew that. You know, someone asked me this morning, they said, well, there was a time when the church thought that the earth was flat. I said, yeah, the church did think that, but God didn't. God never said the earth is flat. He said it's, that the earth rotates, hangs upon nothing, and, and it runs on an axis. God says that in the book of Job. It spins on an axis. And, and, it's, and it's a sphere. God said the earth was round. He never said it was flat. And he never said that the sun rotated around the earth. The medieval church thought that, and, and Greeks thought that, but God never states that. But notice what God did say. The things that are visible and the things that are invisible. There's all kinds of parts of this universe that, that are invisible, and now we're starting to understand that. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And by the way, when we get to these thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, all of a sudden we've, we've lopped over into part of what God made back here is what we would call the whole angelic realm. I mean, we know very little about the angelic realm. It appears, if you look at every verse, it appears that there are seven orders. You can find seven orders of bad angels. And Paul talks about them. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principles principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Jude adds to that, uh, he, he, he calls them by other names. And so there are seven orders of bad angels and good angels. And you know some of the good ones. There's normal angels and there's archangels and there are burning angels, seraphs, and there are living angels, cherubs, and, and there are archangels which are high ones like Michael and archangels. So there are all these types of angels. But part of what Genesis doesn't talk about, but Paul adds, is this part, the angelic realm, the principalities and powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, before not only as the initiator, but, but standing as head over them because it says this, and verse 17, in him all things consist. You know, if you know basic, uh, basic 
what you learn in physics class is that like charges, what? What do like charges do? There we go. We've got a physicist. I know the voice, Dale. I hear you. Where? Yeah, there we go. We have a physics teacher here, an astrophysicist, but they repel. Why in the nucleus can you have like charged particles and they don't explode and the universe dissolve? Well, the clearest for us normal people that don't understand quantum mechanics, look what it says. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Now, that's Colossians 1, that Jesus made the heavens, the earth, the angelic uh, realm, and of course, part of earth, totally tied to earth. In fact, humans are made initially from the dust of the stars? No. What? From dirt, you know? From, from the soil, from the ground of that planet, of the truly what God calls the center of the universe. God even positions his throne over the earth. So the reason that the medieval church said that everything rotated around the earth was not a statement of the solar system as much as a reflection that God sits enthroned over Mount Zion, which happens to be in Jerusalem. So actually, the earth is the center of the universe because God's throne is there, and Jerusalem is the center of the center. It's very interesting when you calculate everything that God talks about. But here is the fascinating portion. Now look at Second Peter with me because I want to show you something. Uh, God has a, a, a countdown clock going, and uh, Second Peter 3 um, is a fascinating passage. Uh, first of all, the Lord in 2 Peter 3 uh, talks about the, the creation of the world, the first five verses. For this they willfully forget, verse 5 of 2 Peter 3, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. Oh, Peter has the same cosmology, the same creationistic viewpoint. So Moses had it, Jesus, I mean Paul had it, of course, Jesus had it because he did it. And now Peter has it. So they all agree with this, that the heavens, created with only four words, actually one word, God said, you know, come into existence, but four words describe it, and the earth. It doesn't say, and, and all the planets and all the people groups and all the various binary stars that have yellow suns so they can have life. You know how they're always, the scientists are looking out there and they're saying, oh, there's another one that could support life. Really? Now there's something that, did you know that it's called the anthropic principle? Did you know that, that there are 21 precise measurements that make life possible? Here's the sun and here's the earth. If the earth was any closer to the sun, any closer, we'd boil off. If we were any further, we would freeze. It's at the exact right place. If the earth wasn't tilted exactly the right way, the weather here would be worse than it is, okay? We would have, we'd all live in Oklahoma, okay? Not just the people in Oklahoma. I mean, the speed of, of our the, the orbit of, I mean, the rotation of the earth, everything, even the mix, you know, the 78, 22 mix of the, of the atmosphere here, the proportion of water not to water, those, there are actually 21 that astrophysicists have worked out, 25 anthropic. In other words, what that's saying is that, that the earth was designed just for humans by somebody. And to find out there another place that has all of those factors, even the luminosity of the sun, the fact that it is a yellow sun and not a red, not a blue, not a white, not a brown, you know, all the different types of stars that the Bible talks about, by the way. The Bible says there are different, there are different types of stars. 
I mean, the Bible's very advanced in astrophysics and everything else. But look what Peter says. He says, oh, so God made the heavens of old, verse 5, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Now look at verse 6. Always tied to creationism is this global flood. And both of those are disparaged by the majority of people who say they're Christians. Biblical creationism is disparaged by 98% of all Christian colleges in America. They don't believe in it. And so is the global flood, which, by the way, God believed in both because he did it, and all the, all the authors of Scripture believed in both. And Peter says it right here. By which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, 2 Peter 3, 6. And he continues in verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what he's saying is, Peter, you know, affirms the creation account. He adds to it the f global flood. It's not a local, it's a global, the world, the whole world, not Anatolia or Mesopotamia or the Black Sea like that uh, fellow that found the Titanic said that the global flood was just around the Black Sea, whatever his name is, because he found evidence he thought of the global flood. I mean of the local flood. It's not local, it's global. But Peter also says one more thing. Notice what he says. Verse 7, the heavens and the earth, same cosmology. The heavens and the earth, he's said it before, but here it is again. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, Right here, he spoke them into existence. A very consistent creationistic cosmology. By the same word, the word that Colossians 1.17, Paul says Jesus Christ holds everything together. He, by the word of his power, he, he just said, matter, nuclei, you're going to hold together. I'm going to keep this universe together. Are held together by the same word, but they're reserved, verse 7, for fire. They're reserved for fire. How long? Until the day of judgment. That's when the fire is going to come. And perdition of ungodly men. Now, Peter adds something. He says, the universe, the universe, the cosmos, this, and this, the geos, the earth, geos, and cosmos. These are reserved. The universe is waiting, reserved, it's waiting for a fiery destruction. The whole thing, and I'm going to show it to you in a second, all of it is going to burn up. For a fiery destruction predicated on one thing. This is what Peter adds mankind. Those higher intelligences, those images of God that God created, and, and there is no room in the scriptures for any other life forms, because if so, God is certainly neglecting them. He is focusing everything, the cross, the work of the angels, the angels are watching over humans. See, anything, any other life forms out there in the universe, there's not any room for them in the scriptures. Now, of course, you can make, a lot of people's theology is from the white spaces. The black spaces are the words, the print. Their theology is, is from the white spaces. They insert here and there. But if you really read this, Moses, Paul, and Peter thought mankind is the center of God's focus. There's the earth, which is the center of the universe from God's perspective, and there's this massive universe around us that God only devotes four words to, but look what's going to happen to it. It says, don't forget this, verse 8, this thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. 
What does that mean? It means that, that God is standing above. He is on a different dimension than we are. We're bound by four dimensions. The, the physical dimensions of length and breadth and depth, and then the, the, the fourth dimension of time. And we can't get out of that. I mean, we can fly different places, but time is still, it, it slows down or speeds up, depending on your speed, but we're still bound by it, by all these laws of the physical universe. God is above that. And, and it says in the, the book of Isaiah that God sees the end from the beginning. He sees all of it at once. For God, the physical universe is flat. And it's all, it's like a flat screen TV. Although I don't think God would watch television, you know, because he's got better things to do. But to him, the universe is like a flat screen TV. He sees everything going on, the ending that we're going to read about, and the beginning, which he initiated. He sees it all at the same time. And so to him, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. What does that mean? It means time doesn't impact God at all. It doesn't mean that we can say that one day in Genesis is like two billion years. That's not what it's saying. But look, look what he's talking about. Verse 9, the Lord isn't slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering. He's, he's waiting many days, many thousands of years, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I'm not going to go into, you know, the, the two views of that. But basically what the Lord is saying is he's waiting for the full fullness of those who are going to be saved to be saved. And then look at this. Here is verse 10. But the day of the Lord. Now day of the Lord is code. All the way through the Old Testament, day of Lord is code for what we would call the end of days involving the second coming, involving the tribulation, the time of Jacob's troubles. It's the whole book of Joel is about the day of the Lord. It's just day of the Lord, day of the Lord. It's the day of his wrath and all that. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Remember the movie, Thief in the Night? There it is. Only that was talking about the rapture, and this isn't. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements, that word stoike, speaks about what we would say the atomic level. To the Greek language, it was the smallest, the foundational elements, the smallest particles. We would call it the subatomic, the atomic and subatomic. The, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Wow. Both the earth and the works in it will be burned up. But, it, but you notice it says the heavens, the universe, what, what I think happens is the Lord that's holding everything together, Colossians 1.17, pulls the pin. He goes, okay, I'm not going to hold together anymore. And the whole universe dissolves. So if there are other life forms out there, they have a short life expectancy because only mankind is redeemed by Christ. And only mankind and the angelic realm and God survive this fiery destruction because look what it says. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, verse 11, what manner of persons ought you to be? Looking forward, verse 12, and hastening the coming of the day of God. How do we do that? We lead people to the Lord. Did you know there's like a clicker? You know, counting off, and when the last one that God has chosen. Boom. You know, lead people to the Lord. It'll hasten the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved. That's the second time it says that. That's the whole universe. Both the visible and the invisible will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And you could go on and on reading that. Basically, Peter has the same cosmology, and Peter says the entire universe is waiting. And, and just, if, if you want to study this more, it's fascinating. Romans 8, Paul adds that the universe right now is groaning, 
under the bondage of what we would call the laws of thermodynamics, the, the, the gradual heat death that the universe is going through. You know, the second law, and, and all the laws are, are keyed to this idea of winding down and going toward destruction. So all of that is coming, but what we're looking for is this new heaven, verse 13, and new earth. So let's go there, and let's, that's where I'll end. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, you asked this question because you let me think about it. Uh, but look at, at chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation. And the last thing I want to show you is, um, why do we say that, that there, is, there are no other aliens out there and other planets and other places where people are? Because everything is going to be destroyed. The only thing that's going to last is there is a heaven... That's where God's throne is. And there's a hell, which is the, member. hell uh, in English comes from the word Gehenna or Gehenna or the valley of Hinnom, the garbage dump of Hinnom, which is a valley that's on the west side of Jerusalem. And it's where the people in the city of Jerusalem, they were a walled on a hilltop city, and they would take their trash and they'd push it over the edge and it would tumble down and they would throw old donkeys that died, bloated and, you know, rotting. They'd push them down there and they'd push all their junk, you know, their appliances and old cars and tires over the walls, you know, just like we do nowadays. And they'd push it all down there and there was a perpetual fire at the bottom of the hill. It was kind of like smoldering. And, and there were also maggots and everything else. Can you think all the garbage going there and stuff burning? I remember we used to go to the dump when I was little. The dump. What a, you know, what a place to go. And that's where everybody threw their trash. And I used to love going to the dump. While my dad was unloading the car, I was scampering around looking for treasures, you know. And, and many treasures would be found. You know, one man's junk is somebody else's treasure. But I remember that dump looked like hell. I mean, it was garbage and things rotting and they were burning parts and they were bulldoze parts. Hell is the garbage dump of the universe that God is going to send all those who bear his image, humans, that rejected their creator and he's going to send all, it was originally built for, Jesus said, the devil and his angels. God, by the way, never predestined anyone to hell. He doesn't say that. Theology says that. God doesn't say that. God predestined no one to hell. But when the devil fell in the rebellion, he said, I'm creating hell for you. So Satan has always known where he's going. And that's why he can't believe that God is going to let him loose and, and do what he wants to do through the Antichrist on earth. He's so excited and he's so dumb he thinks he's going to win. But look who's in heaven. When, when we get to heaven, in chapter 4, you've all seen this, the thrones and, and all the, the voices. Look at verse 10. There are 24 elders who fall down, and, and they say, you, verse 11, are worthy to receive. You created all things. So we get the creation piece in heaven. Then you get to chapter 5, and when you look at chapter 5, look at verse 8. When he took the scroll, that's the title deed to the universe that Satan has usurped and that He's the God of this world, and Jesus is, is, God says, you're the creator. God the Father says to God the Son, you're the creator. You're the rightful owner. You can now, I have waited thousands of years, you can now take back the universe that Romans 8 says is groaning, awaiting the redemption. The whole universe knows its creator. By the way, it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to his own universe, which completely received Christ. When Jesus spoke to a tree, it withered. When Jesus spoke to the ocean, or I mean to the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus spoke to the wind, every creature obeyed him except the humans. Even the demons obeyed him instantly. The, the universe knows, and it's groaning, it's waiting. It knows it's in bondage to sin. It's waiting for the time that's coming. But look, look who is in heaven. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures, those are angelic, the 24 elders representing humans. How do we know they represent humans? Because it says we were redeemed. Who did Jesus redeem? Romans 5 tells us. He only redeemed the descendants of Adam. 
That's why you be careful if your theology doesn't have an Adam and an Eve. If you have an evolutionary view, what, where's Adam? Which Adam? Which humanoid became Adam that God created directly? I mean, and, and, you know, we don't need to go into that, but look what it says in verse 9. They sang a new song. That's the redeemed. That's humans. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and look who's in heaven. In heaven is God, the angels who did not rebel, and one other group. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, not planet, out of every tongue, not solar system, out of every people and nation. God presents to us that the earth is the center of his redemptive focus, that the earth is where he's put all of his attention, that Jesus ever lives to intercede for those that bear the image of God that he created and breathed the life into and made living spirits and created them in his image. Those are the ones he ever lives to intercede for, us who are redeemed. And those are the ones he came to die for. And those are who are in heaven, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign. What's the center of the universe? What does it say in verse 10? Where shall we reign? On the earth. See, there's, there's going to be a new, in fact, now turn to chapter 21, and notice what happens after the big burn. Between Revelation 20 uh, and, uh, and Revelation 21, between Revelation 20 and 21 is inserted 2 Peter 3. It goes right there. That is the great burn of the universe. And then look what happens in verse 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there's no more sea. What's, what's the, what is God focusing on? It's the same thing at the end as it was at the beginning. God says that in the beginning was God. And then God, from nothing, created everything, heavens, which are defying our, I mean, at the creation, if you've ever been to the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum, their little planetarium is one of the most phenomenal things to sit there and finally understand how big the universe is. They just keep doing these exponential, you know, you're in the earth and then you go to the solar system, then you go to our galaxy and then... And all of a sudden, you've gone so many times, you say, this, I can't fit all that in my mind. But God not only fit it in his mind, he named all the stars, calls them all by name, and they obey him. But he's going to burn all that up and burn all this up, and he's going to end up with a new heaven and a new earth, not Alderaan, you know, not wherever, you know, uh, the, the science fiction people have it and everyone who is not redeemed who are in heaven are going to be in hell for as long as everybody's in heaven and that's that's the simple cosmology that god consistently from genesis 1 to revelation 22 presents the same thing isn't that amazing now it doesn't mean that after we're in heaven, that, that God's going to make more of whatever. In fact, I think that, that we already know what's going to be like in heaven because in a fallen world, this is a pretty neat place. I mean, don't you love the taste of food? Don't you like the feel of the wind? Don't you like the colors of the sunset? Don't you like the complexity of stuff that grows and at, at every level, macro and micro? It's all beautiful and symmetrical in 1 Corinthians 14, orderly. God is a God of order. And so I, I believe that probably we will never come to the end of all that he's going to make. And, and since God invented eating, since God invented sexual relations, can you imagine how wonderful heaven's going to be? I mean, everything we experience is fallen, cursed, under bondage. Can you imagine 
how wonderful. You, you think of the best things you've ever known in life. Heaven is better by far, exponentially better. We've never experienced perfection. We've seen it in Christ. We have never experienced it. And, and in that moment when we get there, we're going to be in his image. He's purchased us. We're going to worship him. But a lot of people are worried in heaven. All they're going to do is play their harp, you know, and sit on a cloud. That's not in the Bible. It says we're going to be serving him. And how did we serve him on earth? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to God's glory. Heaven's going to be like that. Whatever we do, traveling to, you know, whatever, God just made a new solar system over there or a new galaxy or another parallel universe. You go over there, we serve him to his glory. It's very exciting.